Escaped sapiens. It's estimated that over 3 million whales were killed in commercial whaling last century, which might be the single largest culling of any animal in terms of biomass in human history. Fortunately, this mostly came to an end in 1986 when an international moratorium on whaling came into effect. In this episode of the Escape Sapiens podcast, I speak with Ian Kerr, who is the CEO of Ocean Alliance, which is an organization that aims to protect whales and their environment. In our discussion, Ian explains some of the new threats such as pollution and resource depletion that are facing whales today, as well as some of the possible solutions. Curiously, while whale oil and whaling ships may have almost led to their extinction, their snot and remote-controlled drones might be the key to their salvation. I had a lot of fun speaking with Ian. I hope you also enjoy hearing what he has to talk about. You started your career as a whale conservation researcher 30-ish years ago, and that's sort of an interesting time to begin a career in whale conservation because I suppose for many years the biggest threats to whales was the biggest threat was uh, whaling. Commercial whaling, and, correct. Yeah, and I suppose at the beginning of your career that was sort of tapering off or coming to or an end around that point. So I want to get a feel for how dire the situation was at the start of your career. You know, uh, do we have any idea quantitatively what damage had been done uh, to whale populations by the time you were starting your career? Boy, I mean, that, that's a, this is almost a two-hour conversation just in that. But I, but I want to tell you something, you know, in case we have people out there who might be interested in getting into this field. I never really planned to be a marine mammal biologist. In actual fact, I was hitchhiking around Argentina, and I met this guy, Roger Payne, on a beach in Argentina. And I, I'm one of these people that I like to think I'm master at nothing, but, but quite good at a bunch of different things. And Roger said, I think your diverse skill set should be sort of applied in this field. And it's probably the first time someone had come to me with that type of positive, um, you know, uh, just positive reflection to my skill set. So it was really, I didn't plan it. I'm, I'm, happy that I, I did go in that direction. And I, and I would almost encourage people with the idea that the world is changing. You know, the, the people in white coats, I don't think are necessarily the people that are going to be solving the problems. It's the sort of innovators, creators, misfits, whatever you might be, you know what I mean, that are actually going to solve the problems because I think we need to be thinking outside the box. Now, with that said, I'll go back to, to your question. What was scary, you know, over 30 years ago is that we actually thought we were going to lose some of these, some of these populations of whales. Mm. So my job was almost akin to running through a burning library and saying, what books can I save? What books should I save? Which is almost, you know, an impossible thing. On top of that, some of the whaling nations were actually lying about the whales they were killing. Mm -hmm. Turned out 20 years later, we found out the Russians were killing blue whales and right whales, you know, species that they weren't meant to be killing. So, I mean, it was just a, a total mess. Mm -hmm. On that point, I mean, actually, so let me give you one, one example. And by the way, um, the wonderful thing about getting a little older is that we don't have to be so precise on our facts. And the wonderful thing about the internet is I'm sure people can correct me on some of the, some of the specific nature, nature of mm -hmm. some of the data. But in the case of sperm whales, so you might say to somebody right now, how many sperm whales are there left? And they may say one or two million, okay? In the case of sperm whales, the males were the big animals and the males were feeding at the poles. And when you look at the whaling data, it's something like 98% of all of the sperm whales that were killed at the poles were males. Mm -hmm. So wait, wait a minute. So, okay, yeah, there's a million whales left. But what happens if 998,000 of them are females and 2,000 of them are, are males? Do you know what I mean? So there's all these sort of curveballs in the data from people not telling the truth to so on that, that really left the whole whale world in chaos. And, and I think now we're only truly beginning to really understand the importance of the interconnectedness of, of, of nature. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in many ways, you know, I got into the whaling industry or, or the anti-whaling industry because I felt it was a great use of my skill set and, and, you know, and it was a worthwhile cause. 
but I didn't realize at that point in time that that um, you know I don't know if your listeners will have heard of the, the whole idea of, of nitrogen pumps, which is whales are sort of diving down deep at certain cases, eating prey down deep, coming to the surface and defecating. And we're we're all very aware in our world of the value of of um, of um, fertilizers. And we're all probably very aware that two out of every three breaths we take come from our oceans, not from rainforests. Rainforests are not quite closed loop, but they they are more closed loop than people realize. So I actually think the fact one of the reasons why the world's fisheries are in such bad shape is we took millions and millions of tons of fertilizers out of the oceans when we killed all these whales. So again, another point to talk about later, but we, we're really understanding the value of the interconnectedness of things. And I live in a fishing town, and any fisherman here can talk to you the importance of an anchor chain. And clearly, you take a link out of an anchor chain, the anchor chain doesn't work anymore. And now we're learning how, you know, certainly we may love a species for whatever reason, but, you know, the earthworms, the amoebas, the, you know, the um, nudibranches, all of these little animals are probably the crew, if you like, on spaceship Earth as we hurtle through space. Mm. And humans, we're, we're all just sitting in first class, drinking and eating and enjoying the ride, you know? As it's crashing. As it's, the, so- yeah, that's right. As we're running out of fuel. With respect to the sperm whales, the fact that... So it was mainly males that were being killed. Did that, did that fact actually help the species rebound at all? I mean, if you were killing all the females, that seems like a worse bottleneck to uh, be sitting yourself in. Potentially. You know, I don't have the answer for that, but I do know that in, in any particular case, do you know what I mean? When people tend to just look at the numbers, you know, most people say, how many sperm whales are left? How many blue whales are left? They won't say... What are the population bottlenecks genetic wise? They won't say how many males versus how many females. So, you know, I hate to say it, my my one liner through today's conversation is probably going to be, well, you know what? That it's an incredibly complicated question, and I'm not quite sure if we have the answer for that. You know, as long as you say it in different ways, that's fine. You got it. The- you got it. <laughs> Um, you, you know, so there's quantitatively, but so I read somewhere that, um, you know, the, the largest sperm whales were the ones that were being targeted. And so that had some selection pressure, such that now the average size of a sperm whale that you see is significantly. So is that true? Well, is that something? Well, I think that's hilarious. Yeah, because um, I can't give you a book, but I was looking in one of these sort of whale ID books recently, and I can't even remember what it was, but it said the average size of a sperm whale is this. Do you know what I mean? And it was something like, I can't even remember, 68 feet or so, you know, or a large animal is 68 feet. And I used to give a talk at the Nantucket Whaling Museum every summer, and they have a huge jaw in there. And as I remember, I think just that jaw was something like 27 feet long. So if you actually go back to the you know, the bit in front of the the jaw and the bit behind the jaw, that probably meant that animal was 70 to 85 feet long. Do you know what I mean? So to your point, Hmm. yeah, you know, we, we've knocked out that, that whole, you know, the, 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 all the big males and, you know, some of these animals probably aren't even fully grown now. You know I mean? These animals are taking 70 to 80, 80 years Mm -hmm. in the case of sperm whales. In the case of other whales, it's thought they might live to be over 150, 160 years. Mm-hmm. So we aren't even seeing the big guys and big girls back yet, you know? Oh, so, so it's, it's not that they were taken out of the population genetically. It, it's just that we're not that we haven't had enough time uh, to reproduce those larger. Is that the more of the case? Exactly. I mean, you know, when I, scientists I are out there collecting data, you go out and you, you know, you see a thousand whales, you say, okay, this is the average size of what I'm seeing when the reality is the, the population hasn't caught up from, from the post whaling days, in my opinion. Another thing that's, uh, you know, whales are pretty smart, right? So have, do we see them avoiding the old hunting grounds? Is, is that something that, that we, we can see? A great question. And, you know, smart. Okay, so let's take a little segue. You know, technically, we're a smart species, yet the fruits of our intelligence are bringing the extinction of two or three species a day. So um, 
I think humans are smart. I don't think we are wise at this point in time. With reference to whales, man, I, I gave a talk once on alien intelligence. Well, it was a total sort of hypothetical talk because, you know, in most cases with the large whales, they have no predators. You know, us, we're scared of anything. Snake, ant, mm -hmm. mosquito, dog, wolf, elephant. You know, we're like scared of everything. Our life is almost based on fear. What would your life be if you didn't have any predators? You weren't scared of anything. So, you know, and and whales sort of live in a world of sound. We live in a world of sight. There, there's um, there's a segue on dolphins. Actually, I won't do right now. So, you know, I'm not qualified to describe what um, how whales use their intelligence, but certainly. They have large brains. They have large spinal cords, which is actually typically more important because the spinal mm -hmm. cord is the internet cable that's bringing all the information out that shows there's processing going on. I mean, if, if you ask me to make a guess, I, I would probably say I would like to think that um, a lot of whale brains are actually giant acoustic computers where mm -hmm. they're you know, they're just taking in information about their environment at levels we can't even imagine, at levels perhaps our navies would, would be in awe of, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. back to your question, the only reason why commercial railing was successful was that the whales kept going back. Mm -hmm. And I think... Because they weren't scared. That, well, I, you know, I hate to say it, the ones that were, the ones that were killed were taken out. There weren't lessons learned. I'll, I'll tell you a fun story here. And, um, um, you know, I hope you don't have too intellectual of an audience here because I'm really taking it down there. But, but quite seriously, we went around the world from 2000 to 2005 biopsying sperm whales, okay? And we were mm -hmm. trying to get um, baseline information on the distribution and concentrations and effects of, of, of like man-made pollutants, okay? The sad news mm -hmm. is I thought we it would be like a pre-pollution voyage, but actually we discovered that a lot of these pollutants had already been moved all around the ocean. We could talk about that mm -hmm. later, but I would be on the bow of the boat with a biopsy gun, okay? Are you a good shot? Well, you know, I am a good shot. So, so, uh, but because <laughs> on many levels, that's the tip of the spear. Everything you've done prior to that point, funding, boats, permit, food, logistics, is all so you can get that biopsy data. So you better. But be you're the captain, right? I, well, you know what? I was the expedition leader. I was part time captain, but that, that's right. Sort of, you know. But I think. But still, you're the one with the gun out there. <laughs> well, I, I mean, to be blunt, in many cases, I was just a better shot. You know, we all went mm -hmm. out there and practiced, and whoever was the better, I, I don't care if it had been the, the 17 year old intern. Had the 17 year old intern been a better shot than me, they would have been out on the bow, you know, mm -hmm. because everything you, has brought you to that point. But here's something that I've never written a paper on, and I don't think I have the data on, but it's sort of interesting. I believe more often than not, when we came up to a whale, a sperm whale, okay, mm -hmm. to biopsy it, it would turn up wind. And why did I know it turned up wind? Because suddenly I'm going up and down and up and down. And now I've got it, you know, like, so one minute I'm going crosswind and it's nice and level and I want to take that shot. Now suddenly I'm bouncing up and down. And if you actually think about it, if in the old days with the sailing ships or mm. even the rowboats, a sperm whale had swam upwind, it might have got away. So that could have been like a biologically sort of successful um, adaptation. Mm. So it might not have been a purposeful adaptation. Do you know what I mean? But guess what? The ones that went upwind lived and the ones that didn't, mm. didn't. You know what I mean? Mm. Anyway. Just but... Uh you, you, you might ask, why wouldn't they dive, right? Because the ships can't follow them under the water. Well, that is true. But, but often, I mean, they're, they're pre-programmed. I mean, often they will, but, but it almost goes back to that no pre predator thing. Like you go back to mm -hmm. the Galapagos and a bird just lands on your shoulder because there's no predators. I mean, this is sort of what mm -hmm. the whole world was like before man. 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So just because a sailing boat came up next to a whale, they weren't, they didn't know that this was a predator. You know, it, it makes me think of another interesting point. This is something I wanted to ask you about, actually. So I, I've, I've heard that another threat to whales these days is uh, whale strikes. When, when a big boat sort of will hit, you know, the propellers uh, carve up the back of the whale Correct. back. And um, so what I wanted to know is, are, are ships simply too fast for the whales? Or is it that the whales just don't recognize the the ships as being dangerous and and so they 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 don't try to avoid them what what what's what's going on there yeah it's interesting and i'm i'm hoping during the course of the, our chat you'll have some easy questions for me you know we, we they won't <laughs> all be so um but i want to go back just to sort of finish on that other point which is you know the good news for researchers is that whales are still going to these traditional whaling grounds. The mm -hmm. bad news now with climate change is typically things like climate change move slowly and animals have time to adapt. We're now changing things quicker than these species often have the capacity to adapt to. And that's probably one of the biggest problems here. Do you know what I mean? These animals mm -hmm. have adapted over millions of years and we're changing things in decades. Back to ship strikes. I think that the good news about a ship strike, just FYI, is that this is not actually a population threat. Do you know what I mean? Okay. We're not losing thousands of whales by ship strikes. They're just a very obvious thing. You know, the whale is over the bow of the boat or it's mm -hmm. got the scars on the back of the pro propeller. And I think to your point, yeah, it's just an, it's an, unidentified threat to a whale you know they blue whales don't tend to just swim into each other you know what i mean mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. so, it, so the truth is i don't have an answer to that question but but mm -hmm. i think it's a very interesting question um i mean again even if you look at manatees you know manatees hear these propeller noises squealing in the water but they haven't learned that that is necessarily a threat you'd think that a big loud propeller would be something terrifying for a whale but uh, but it, but this is yeah. what's so interesting again, you know. It's back to that giant acoustic computer. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I'd like you and I to pretend that they're, they're processing sound at a level that we can't even imagine, and it could just be you know I don't know what that is. I'll filter it out. I'll put it over here. You know, mm -hmm. and again, sort of a low frequency chum 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 chum. You know, I've dragged an acoustic array around the world. An acoustic array is a line of underwater microphones or hydrophones you tow behind the boat. And the noisiest parts are the cavitation. It's when you accelerate. But mm -hmm. often when the propeller is just going, chum, 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 it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's not, it's not that big of a noise. And by the way, a lot of these boats are moving to your point, 20, 30 knots. And there is a theory out there now Whales are voluntary breathers. I don't know if you know that. You cannot mm. anesthetize a whale. You know, anesthetic mm. works with you and I because we will go to sleep, but we keep breathing. Whales are mm. voluntary breathers. So one of the theories out there is that whales actually never totally sleep. They sort of mm. nap. We think some of them nap underwater, like certain birds. I don't know if you heard. They can actually lock their wings and take a nap in flight, and they just spiral. Like an albatross slowly. or something like exactly. this. Exactly. So it could be. So it could be again. One, um, you know, the animals could be napping. Two, there are two I times see. with with whales where sort of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and one of them is feeding. So like mm -hmm. one of these great feeding areas is right off California, right off Long Beach, where there's these huge blooms of krill, and you know what? That animal is like I'm. I'm you know, I'm going for all the all, all I can eat. You know, I'm going for it. So if it's totally focused on feeding, it's more at risk. And guess what? The other one is 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 mating. When an animal is totally focused on mating, you know, everything else sort of goes out the window. Hmm. I suppose also if they're napping, then they want to be close to the surface. They can get that breath uh, easily. Yeah, I mean, we don't really know. Believe it or not, there's even an idea they shut down half of their brain. So half of their brain mm -hmm. is sleeping, you know what I mean? And half of yep. their brain is awake. I, I can empathize with these animals. I think half of my brain went to sleep about a decade ago, and I can't wake it up again. 
But so you mentioned global warming. I <laughs> just I, just going back a little bit. One thing that I'm curious about, and I, I, I'm wondering if you have the answer to, is um, <laughs> with the ice caps melting, does that produce more or less environment for whales to swim around in? You know, is that just to their benefit or to their detriment? Well, I. Um... So again, a quick step back. Dolphins are small toothed whales, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't like the whale and dolphin group because that's basically the whale and whale group. But I want mm -hmm. your, your, your listeners to understand you've got the great whales, you know, the Mr. Seti, the baleen whales, humpback, fin, blue, right, gray, brutus whale, etc. And then you've got the odontoceti, the toothed whales, which are orca, a sperm whale, um, beaked whales, belugas, so on and so on, and all of the dolphins. So all of the dolphins are, um, are whales, okay? Mm -hmm. You and I really right now are more talking about the great whales, and the, and the great mm -hmm. whales tend to be um, feeding at the sort of the bottom of the food chain. They're, they're feeding on, on the krill and all this type of stuff. And I love... Um, there's an author called Douglas Adams once that, that did a whole story about how the um, um, the Komodo dragon evolved. So if we did a same sort of Douglas Adams parody here, it's like, okay, I'm going to invent krill. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invent this species and they will only get together once a year. So guess what? No species will ever be able to feed on krill. Ah, mm. someone says, I'm going to invent the blue whale. And the blue whale is going to be a massive fasting machine so I can live all year without eating until the krill will come, and then I'll put on two tons of food a day for like a month. Now that's do a, they actually do that? Well, it's, it, it's not quite that long, but that is the basic, that is the, the sort of foundation story. These great whales are ultimate fasting machines, okay? I didn't realize that. That's right. And that's why some of them, by the way, they think don't cross the equator because all of this food is actually, they have a temperature regulation problem. Do you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. know, imagine you were wearing 12 coats with cans of beans in them. Do you know what I mean? You, you know, you'd be like, man, I'm, I'm overheating. And one year... Um, uh, it was a long time ago, but we were seeing southern right whales with their mouths open in Peninsula Valdez, where we have a camp. And we're like, oh, they're feeding here, but we didn't think they were feeding here. And now we actually think they have this organ in their mouth called a reet, and they can engorge the reet with blood. And if they're overheating, you know, they then open their mouths and the cold water goes over this bulbous organ in the top of the mouth and cools them down. This is another reason why I love working with whales. You know, there is so much still to be learned. It's like you can't make this shit up. Pardon my language. You know what I mean? It's exciting. Yeah. What, where were we? I can't even remember. Oh, so I was asking. Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> I was asking you whether the global warming gave whales more uh, marine environment or less to swim around in. Well, okay, so the issue, and, and it's quite interesting because um, Vicky Roundtree from our team, um, we have a southern right whale program, which is the longest ongoing study of any great whale species using um, photo photography. And this year will be our 51st year, okay? Now, what Vicky and her team have discovered, alas, some, some dead whales, you know these baleen plates that hang down? These baleen plates are a little bit like trees, which is you can see growth lines in in the... Oh. Baleen plates and those growth lines speak to more productive or less productive years. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm 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 condensing a, a a more complicated subject into a less complicated subject. But but in short, the the baleen whales are feeding off the krill, and a lot of the krill are feeding off the algae that's living on the bottom of the ice. So actually, when it's warm. You're getting more ice melt, and because I think you're changing the salinity of the water, you're getting less algae. So there's a mm -hmm. whole different problem here. The problem is 
that climate change is affecting their food supports. And Vicky, I'm sure we can find this paper somewhere, but and we can put it in a link at the end. But Vicky and her team are showing, again, in warmer years, it's less productive, less food. So it's actually bad for, bad for the whales. As for a larger ocean, I think proportionally, they, they probably couldn't tell if you consider that, you know, 71% of the planet is water anyway. I mean, another mm -hmm. fun statistic, if you don't mind, because I, I think whoever called this planet, planet Earth should be fired. You know, we're on planet ocean. 71% of the planet, you know, is water. Every country has this 200 mile economic exclusive zone off its shoreline. But if you take that 200 mile from the 71% of the planet, you still end up with 50% of the planet technically being international waters, the whole planet. So 50% of the whole planet is international waters that technically belong, if you like, to nobody or actually belong to everybody. Hmm. And in the 1800s in England, there was a guy called Garrett Hardin that talked about the tragedy of the commons which is the commons land being used by everybody and not cared by, by, by any, you know, by everybody type of thing, used by everybody, not cared for by anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think the sad news is our oceans are really the, the 21st century tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. Do you think they sh there should be some ownership uh, given over to the uh, deeper waters or? Well, it, it's interesting. I just think, um, you know, so this is my challenge. How do I get people to care about something they can't see? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter, but I'm, I'm near Boston. I'm, I'm British, but I'm near Boston here. And America's first um, environmentalist was this gentleman called Henry David Thoreau. And Thoreau mm -hmm. said, we do not associate the idea of antiquity with the oceans as we do the land. So when I look mm -hmm. out today, and just see this surface of the ocean, I can't see, you know, higher um, CO2 levels. I can't see higher levels of microplastics. I can't see all the garbage that is sort of washing down from our terrestrial consumer lifestyles. I mean, as you know, the oceans are downhill from everything and gravity never sleeps. So our oceans are in many ways, you know, humanity's toilet. Um, you got to understand that might mean one day, one week, one year or 10 years. But, you know, the Mississippi that runs through the heartland of America, all this shit is inexorably making its way into our oceans, you know, hmm. and but but it's an invisible problem, you know. So I, I have to ask you then, you know, for the longest time we, we were doing commercial whaling and. I mean, for a naive person who's not in the field, it seems like there was a pretty fast transition from, from when there was public consensus that whaling was okay to it just being completely, you know, something you didn't, you didn't agree with. So what happened there? Was, was it uh, that whaling became more visible or was it that our technology improved to the point that we no longer needed whale oil? So, so what happened there that made the moratorium happen and, and the anti-whaling campaign so successful? Yes. Yes to all of your theories. That, no. um, well, I, I'm going to be a bit biased here, but you know, our founder, Roger Payne, uh, and president still, Roger Payne, is the guy who discovered that whales sing songs. And I really think that was the catalyst. Suddenly, these were not, you know, large bits of blubber floating around in the ocean. They were singer poets. And then people started looking at them. Science and technology gave us an opportunity to look at these animals and their complex lifestyles and how they communicate. It's the same with apes and, and Jane Goodall. So I think it was an incredible renaissance time, you know, with reference to um, biology communication, television. But I think, yeah, I think people at one level fell in love with whales. And I will tell you, people are still in love with whales. And I am, again, a little bit confused because I go around and every television show, promotional, there are like whale icons everywhere. But you know what? There does not seem to be a lot of money going into whale research. You know, it's like I... 
it, it, it seems to be such a disconnect, you know what I mean? Finally, somebody that's, you know, has a, had a bit of fun with one of your friends. Say, hey, do you have any whale art? Do you have any whale jewelry? And then say to them, have you given any money to whale research recently? Just ask them, as you said. It, it, there's a weird disconnect, which I don't understand, but it's okay. I mean, you know, whales are wonderful sort of charismatic megafauna, you know? And I started off our whole conversation by saying, you know, one of the biggest and most important discoveries in biology today is the interconnectedness of species, how that's important. So if whales are the vehicle that are engaging people with the wild world, that's great. The problem that, that I have as a whale biologist is, you know, as you said, 30 years ago, it was commercial whaling. Now we've got pollution, acoustic bleaching, ship strikes, entanglement in nets, entanglement in lines, and then sort of a whole host of sort of drift nets and illegal activities that are happening in some of the poorest countries of the world. So our challenges now have got 10, time wor 10 times worse, yet, you know, I, I almost saw something like, I saw a bumper sticker the other day, that something like Jane Fonda nuked the whales, which is like, you know, hey, you know, hey man, we've been saving the whales for 30 years, yet you haven't done it yet? You know? Yeah, I, I guess when it comes to commercial whaling, you can sort of point the finger at a bad guy. Yeah. You know, as you said, the problems these days are multifaceted and you can't just say, oh, it's the hunters, they need to stop. Exactly. I suppose we need to stop producing so much pollution. So it's more, I suppose there's a personal accountability aspect there that is, is less fun to deal with. Um, in, in terms of motivating people to 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 actually address these problems you mentioned at the start Ro roger payne sort of got you involved with the ocean alliance to to start with how did he motivate you what what was it that you know caught your attention like why why yeah. why whales for you well thank you but i'm going to go back one step again as is my <laughs> way no no but i i i i want people to to try to understand this you know we have a slogan and our slogan is healthy whales healthy oceans healthy humans. Humanity needs healthy oceans to survive. Two out of every three breaths we take. So I don't really care if you don't like whales. It's all right by me. I love them. I think I like some whales more than I like some people. But we need people to understand, again, some of the most interesting conversations I've had uh, with a couple of astronauts. I was very lucky to um, meet Leyland Melvin. He and I were co-speakers at the United Nations. And he was like, you know, he went up in a spaceship to join the space station. And when they're up there, they're getting resupplied and they're getting, you know, all this and everything on the space station is valuable. And I almost love the idea of saying to people, hey, we are on spaceship Earth. And guess what? We aren't getting resupplied, you know. Mm -hmm. So let's just let's just pay a little bit more attention. I mean, I think we went through an era where it's like, to your point, you're an environmentalist or you're not. You're good or you're bad. And nothing's like that. And I encourage your listeners to say, maybe get a bit more educated and maybe do one thing a week or one thing a month. Do you know what I mean? And actually understand. Um, I hate to keep throwing these quotes out there, but I think it was Edmund Burke said, nobody did worse than he who did nothing for fear they could only do a little. Hmm. People need to understand, you know, the environment is dying a death of a million little cuts. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And those million little cuts are coming from all of us. Now, am I a hypocrite? Do I drive around in a car that burns oil? Yes. Do I fly to conferences? Yes. But I've come to terms with my hypocrisy, and I try to find some balance. And I would just say to people, it's in your own self-interest to have healthy oceans. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, back to sort of why I got involved. I think for me, again, I like to think I have quite a diverse skill set. You know what I mean? I love engineering. I love biology. I love storytelling. And I love adventures. And I love puzzles. And So which of, which of those skills were the ones that Roger Payne pointed out in you? Well, you I, mentioned the stuff. Yeah, I think he liked all of them. I think, I mean, <laughs> my... My analogy a little bit, and this could be wrong and I need to be careful because, 
you know, but I, I, I did not know who Roger Payne was when I met him on this beach. And I was with another friend, two friends of mine, and we were just down there. And everyone else around Roger, no disrespect, was like, you know, we're with Roger Payne, an unbelievable guy, knighted in the Netherlands, MacArthur fellow, all that type of stuff. I did not know this. And they were doing something, some engineering thing or whatever. And I said to Roger, you know, this is my memory. I said to Roger, you know, I think you're doing it wrong. To which half of the group, I think, probably went like, you know, yeah. you know. And Roger, I give him enormous credit. Said, well, well, how would you do it? And I said, well, I think I would do it this way. And my memory of it is we did it that way and it worked. And then he said to me, now, who are you? You know, because I was just a guy on the beach. And hmm. I don't know. I mean, for me, at least, um, you know, for th those people listening that know Roger Payne, Roger Payne is the great uplifter, you know. Some people step on other people to reach the top of the game. You know, Roger has lifted other people up and sometimes they've helped him and sometimes they've run beyond him. But Roger is, you know, one of the most generous people I've ever met. I think he suffered for it a little bit. But at the end of the day, he is content because he feels, you know, look how much more I've generated by, you know, starting a thousand small little you know, sort of environmental machines rather than just focusing on my my environmental machine. I don't know, bad analogy, but you know what I'm saying. But so from meeting him on the beach to actually, you're now the CEO of Ocean Alliance, yeah. right? So, so it's, it's, how many years did it take you from being meeting Roger Payne on the beach to being the CEO of his, uh, his I guess, company? Well, okay. Well, you're digging deep here. I mean, I'll, I'll give it to you as I remember it. And maybe someone, if I'm wrong, they can um, correct me. So I actually had a degree in education from the University of London. And actually, I'd started a small company building hovercraft. We don't have to get into that. But I started a small company in Miami building hovercraft. And while I started my boat company, I met people who would say, Ian, would you sail my boat? from Miami to New York, I'll give you a couple of grand. Mm -hmm. Now imagine being 20 years old and someone saying, will you drive my Porsche to Key West? I'll give you a couple of grand. So <laughs> I was like delivering these yachts and the boats got bigger and bigger. And then I got a big yeah. license. And then I got up to about 100 feet. And suddenly it wasn't an adventure anymore because you were just managing the boat, you know, mm -hmm. managing the engineer. And I'm like, ah, you know, so I sort of got bored with that. And then about six months after I met Roger, Roger said, hey, I need someone to take a 90-foot research vessel to the Galapagos, and I can't afford to pay them. And I'm like... And you said, yes. I I'm your man. I'm your man. And, and um, I don't mean to be rude, but, but I saw people in the Galapagos, you know, with like black buckets that they were putting thermometers in to measure the temperature. And we're on the equator, and, and we're like, well, why don't we have a, an electronic sensor go in our water intake valve, which is six feet below the surface. So, you know, because maybe that bucket was red hot because it was sitting on the deck. Or maybe, you know what I mean? It seems like there are too many variables here. And so I, I ended up just helping more and mm -hmm. more scientists to was sort of being almost a science facilitator, you know? And then, yeah. and it, you know... It, then it got deeper and deeper and Roger would be like, okay, I want to do this. How would you do it? Okay, I want to do that. You know, let's do this. And so ultimately what happened was um, um, the tail started wagging the dog. But, but I can sort of tell you, and, and this almost speaks to what I said earlier, Roger wanted to make an IMAX film on Wales called Wales. And he wanted to make the film because there were more IMAX theaters per capita in Japan than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And Roger's like, if we can get people swimming with whales, you wouldn't kill whales. You wouldn't eat it. You know, you wouldn't eat your dog or your cat. It's, it's just, you can't even imagine it. So Roger's like, I want to get people swimming with whales. So an IMAX camera is very heavy. You don't move it around a lot. You can't go, oh, there's a whale over there. Dive over here. You know, all the audience would be sick. So when Roger put forward this idea, 
okay? People weren't that interested because they said, I don't think we can make an IMAX film on Wales. And Roger said, if we put good science and good filmmaking together, we can do this. But ultimately, Roger gave up his share of the movie to get it made, okay? And the movie's gone on. Sorry, what do, what do you mean by that? He giving up his share? Well, basically everyone else, like all, all the other sort of co-producers and whatever had like a, a, a royalty component. And Roger okay. said, I will give up my royalties to get it made, okay? Mm-hmm. The movie's now made, it's, you can still see it, it's made over 130 million. Roger hasn't mm-hmm. seen a penny. Mm-hmm. That's when I actually said to Roger, Roger, I, I don't mind working for you, but you could have kept half of 1% of the gross and that would have then funded your research for the rest of the, you know, mm-hmm. and Roger's like, great. Okay, Ian, you're in, mate. So I basically started using my, you know, my business development skills. And don't laugh, I, I, I almost say to my staff every year, okay, we're a 50-year-old startup, you know, how are we going to sort of go forward from here? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. what can happen with industry is you can come, come, you can come complacent. And our yeah. reality is, not that I want to, but I can't compete with Woods Hole. I can't compete with Scripps. I can't compete with all these other groups. So we have to out-innovate, out-think, be more creative, or, or we'll go bankrupt, you know? Mm. So this is why you're bringing on all the new technology, such as drones. You've got Snotbot going. I will get into that in a second, but I have sure. to. <laughs> I have to ask you to start with: was was the movie successful in Japan? Did it have uh, it the impact? It that- was very successful. And in fact, I will um, let me. I just found the um, the link to the promo. It's got a Yanni sort of music, little like two minute intro that we can give a link to at the end of the story, which is, it's just great, you know? And by the way, it was, um, it was one of the most enjoyable experiences in my life working on that film. At that point in time, I was actually the captain on the Odyssey, you know, and so I was driving the boat, which was holding the camera. And, um, but it, it, it was exciting. And you know why? Because what a wonderful experience to have sort of, people of such different disciplines working together. And I would say, when I grew up, they said to me, science or the arts, do you know what I mean? Mm. And, and again, I think that world is dead. It should be mm. scientists, educators, artists, musicians. Everyone needs to be collaborating together to create a healthy, mm. not just a healthy work environment, but a healthy environment period, you know? We're currently collaborating, a physicist and a marine biologist exactly. or yeah. conservationist. Well, no, and um, I, I appreciate the invitation to tell the story with you. I mean, a physicist and a, a biologist. This is great. The So, okay. So we have to jump into what you're actually doing now with, with uh, um, Ocean Alliance. So, so you're out there, you're spending your time captaining boats all over the world. What is, okay, I'm being unfair. I'm no, asking no, good, you to good. encapsulate. 30 years of what you're doing into a soundbite. But so what is the actual goal that, that you're aiming for in your, in your missions when you're, you're, when you're out on the water? Yeah, so generally, we're trying to do what I call conservation science, you know? Mm-hmm. And again, maybe a bad analogy, but we've sort of alluded to this in the past. People like saying, this is the problem. This is why mm-hmm. I can't charge the power. This is broken. You know what I yeah. mean? So we try, to, we try to find issues and problems that we can collect scientific data on that we can then use to sort of affect change. And we've helped um, start a marine mammal sanctuary in the Indian Ocean, um, Papua New Guinea, and so on and so on. But, um, you know, if I take a step back to, to, to give you an example here about where we are right now, um, most wildlife will not show you that it's sick or it's hurt. Mm-hmm. Because if you do, you become more bioavailable. What do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. You become more available to predation. Because we know predators will look for babies or sick animals or infirm animals. So generally, when you look at wildlife, 
you know, it doesn't let you know it's sick. I get a hangnail, I scream like a stuck pig. So I've been very interested in, in understanding health threats. And probably, you know, one of the biggest threats to, to marine mammals is just this pollution, you know, because this, these compounds we create just wash down into the ocean. And a lot of these chemicals we create, they're as soluble in water as gold is in water, but they're very soluble in fat. And mm -hmm. so you get basically what's called um, bioconcentration, which is the small ocean of fat, which is all the plants and the animals that have fat in them sort of suck up all these pollutants. And then you get bioamplification. This animal eats that animal, eats this animal. Mm -hmm. So you move up the trophic level of the food chain. And then alas, in mammals, we have what's called the generation effect which is in that act of, of nursing and actually through gestation, the mother can pass the legacy of her toxic load onto the next generation. Mm. And I'm going to say a wild statement here, but I believe particularly with the, the toothed animals, the toothed whales feeding at the top of the food chain, I think it's highly likely that they, they lose their first child because this, mm. this animal is so riddled with you know, the toxic legacy of its parent. Have, have you, uh, I guess this is jumping ahead a little bit too much, but have you been able to do biopsies on, on the mother before and after they've had calves exactly. to see the toxic level? Exactly, yes. Yeah, and they've seen like a 90% difference between toxic load before the child and after the child. In the beginning, we're like, well, how, where did it all go, you know? Mm -hmm. But, but so, does that mean, is, is that in some sense, okay, it's not good, but then the second calf, the third calf, then have a higher chance of survival? How many calves do the tooth whales in general have? Well, again, we've got to be careful here, but anywhere from sort of, they'll have a calf from every one to three years, mm -hmm. you know. But again, a lot of them um, take a long time before they're, um, they're fertile and so on. But I want to dial it back a little bit and say... Um, the, the, the toxicology work, alas, is incredibly expensive. You know what I mean? And chasing down an animal to get a sample <laughs> also seems a little counterintuitive. And by the way, they do it with a lot of species. I'm sure you've seen all sorts of wildlife shows where they chase down a rhino, chase down a giraffe, whatever. To me, again, how would you feel if I said, okay, you know, head on down the street, I want to see how healthy you are. I'm going to take a biopsy sample, you know, and, and we get what they call either the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or the observer effect where the act of collecting the data can change the data. And I was working in the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon disaster with sperm mm -hmm. whales, which, by the way, were living around the area where the spill happened even though most of the focus was on the shorelines and everything else. So we were offshore trying to biopsy sperm whales. And I don't want to make a joke of it, but I felt like I was playing the world's most expensive version of whack-a-mole because the sperm mm. whale would come up over here. We'd race over there and then it would dive. I'm like, oh, man, oh mm. sperm whale over there. We'd race over there and then it would dive. And I'm like ripping up $100 bills and I was like, you know, there's got to be an easier way of doing this. And it was literally the end of one day, you know, the whale at Dove, we didn't get the sample. And, you know, I've got to go back to my funders and say, I need this money to collect these samples. And I'm competing with people that are looking after sort of orphanages in Bangladesh and, and you know, all of the sort of the social ills of our, the social problems of our own society from, you know, homelessness to kids not having food. So, you know, fundraising is a challenge to some of these, to other people, what are more abstract problems. I don't think it's abstract, as we've said earlier. But I was on the bow, the whale dove, I was thoroughly pissed off. And to make matters worse, I was then immersed in this cloud of whale snot. Okay. Yeah. And As you it know what? Blew out the top. Yeah. I mean, they blow, we see these blows. And you know what? They're pretty damn disgusting. They're like fishy and a little bit sticky and smelly. And, you know, I'm like, you know, let's just sign off on this perfect day. No samples. Now all my clothes stink. You know, everything stinks and whatever. 
And then as I thought about it, I'm like, you know, to a biologist, stinky is good. Stinky mm. means productive. And I was like, I wonder if um, I wonder if anybody's ever actually looked at whale snot. And I went online. By the way, it's called exhaled breath condensate. I went online, mm. and um, a couple of people had done it in captivity. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. They'd actually got DNA from the snot. And I think what we have to remember is, you know, you and I are breathing in and out here, eight to ten miles an hour mainly. You know, when a whale exhales, they're explosive breathers. They literally go. Pff, you know, just like yeah. that. But because they're explosive breathers, they're sloughing off little bits of skin. And as it turns out, they're giving this, they're throwing into this air, this biological, this priceless biological data set for an, for an individual that's interested in, in doing a health assessment of those animals. And when we were biopsying, often the data you got is a legacy data set. You know what I mean? The animal's eaten, it's processed, it's moved through its system, mm -hmm. and it's stored in its blubber. When it's exhaling, that's what's happening right now in the bloodstream. Because if you think about it, the reason our lungs work is because those alveoli walls are so close to the bloodstream, you're getting a gaseous exchange. Well, guess what? Other things are being exchanged too. So DNA, hormones, microbiomes. We're now talking about ketones and metabolomics, and it's really exciting. For me, at least, my hobby was flying radio-controlled machines. You know, I wanted to have something that was very different from biology so I could say, okay, I'm not working, because these jobs tend not to be a nine-to-five. They tend to be, you're thinking about it, you're working on it, you got to do something else. Do you know what I mean? So I was just sitting on the bow, and I'm like, well, maybe I could fly one of my machines into the whale blow, because the problem was, you know, the whales would only be half a mile away, but, you know, half a mile away at eight knots, to your point, if the animal has done 12 out of the 15 blows it wants to do, then it will just be like, well, I don't know what that is. I'm just going to go anyway. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So mm. I thought maybe I could fly something over there. And in 2012, 2011, the world of hovering drones was just emerging. I started off with the idea of an airplane with this sort of, here's the blow, and you go like, whoosh, zoom through the blow. Yeah. But I then basically thought, well, well, maybe we can just hover above it and, and, and collect some snot. I want you to know, almost everybody disliked the idea because the drones are blowing down to stay up and the whales are blowing up. So it's like, you know, it would all be blown away and I won't drag you through the whole snotty evolution process beyond the fact that we created a compressed air gun, almost like one of these potato guns, and we 3D printed whale blowholes that we put in the top, and we called this <laughs> snot shot. So basically, we, we could practice shooting snot up in the air, and then ultimately, they wouldn't let you test this on a whale, so we had a little catamaran that we put air pressure sensors, hydrophones, you know, all these sensors. We called that the snot yacht. So we put the snot shot on the snot yacht, and then we flew the snot bot above it. You noticing a theme here? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, were you shooting up just water, or did you have fake snot as well? No, we actually were... we primarily just sh shot water, because we were thinking if the whale snot is any more viscous, the less viscous, yeah. if you can do it mm -hmm. with less viscous, it'll be better with mm -hmm. more viscous. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And what's mm -hmm. actually interesting, we started with things hanging and we found incredible, there are incredible materials here that like suck liquids up. And I'm like, oh man, that's fantastic. But then guess what? I had to get the liquids out. Mm. And when I first went down to Mexico, I wish I'd taken a photograph of this guy. When I first tried this out in Mexico, because I couldn't get a permit to do it in North America, but my friends in Mexico said, come and try it down here. I literally had a centrifuge under one hand and a drone under the other hand. And the customs guys were, what were you doing? I said, I'm collecting whale snot. And the guy was like, what? Just, just, just go, just go. Because the great sponges, I then had to get the stuff out. And as we tried spinning it out, bits of the sponges were getting brought out with it. Mm. 
So that's why ultimately we ended up with Petri dishes or Petri dishes. But in the beginning, we had the Petri dishes at the bottom, but we noticed, and I guess it's because if this is the drone, you know, with the propellers here, they're like sucking air in. And we realized if you get behind the whale, the whale blow is sort of doing this. So if you've got lemons, make lemonade. Don't try fighting the downwash. Let's use the downwash to get the snot onto the dish. So now the Petri dishes, believe it or not, are on the front of the drone and on the top of the drone. And we're, we're sort of flying into that whale blow. And again, I'll give you a couple of clips so you can, you can play to see how well it works. And it's worked really well. And you know what's so cool? These Petri dishes, they're sterile. We have three dishes closed. We, get, we, we 3D print little arms to hold them. The dishes are closed. We're ready to go. Okay, whale is up. We open up the dishes. Now we've got six plates. We fly out. We fly back. We close up the plates, wrap them, put them in the fridge. There we go. You know, so a lot of, you know, your newest iPhone is always more expensive, more complicated, blah, blah, blah. The, the things that work really well in the field are affordable and they're field friendly and they're easy to use. And I really don't deserve any credit here. I was just like bumbling forward with my own incompetence, like, you know, how can I make this work? But it's, I think Snotbot is a great case study to how I see the future of wildlife conservation. Because, you know, in the, if they replayed the movie, The Graduate, remember the movie in The Graduate, the guy said to Dustin and Hossman, he said, Dustin, the future is plastic. I say to you, Dustin, the future is drones. Because we're going to have AI, you know, doing the things we're not good at. We're going to have more drones. I mean, right now, I have people on the right making more and more better sensors for different things. I have people on my left making more and better drones for different things. And I'm ductating the two of them together. And I'm telling you, I'm brilliant, you know, which other people are doing the work. All I'm really doing is a, a, a sort of a unique combination. Hmm. And this is what I think your listeners and kids should be doing. How can I just think outside the box? You know, no one told me I couldn't do that. Well, why don't I do that? You know? But so you, you've designed this uh, bot that can fly into the whale blow and cl collect uh, some biological matter, you know, the... <laughs> The, Exhale breath condensate. The, yeah. the snot. Yeah. And uh, so the the question is, so what can you find from 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 this information? What 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 markers do you find uh, every time you go out and collect a sample? Right, right. Well, many layers to the cake, but but first of all, my goal, and I want to be very clean here, clear here, is to do a non-invasive health assessment. And I'm going to do my usual thing, and I'm going to go back a step. Because the problem with endangered species is um, there tend to be two camps, okay? And camp number one is like, oh, my God, we're losing this species. Let's do everything. Catch it, biopsy it, follow it, study it, tag it. Let's do everything we can so we can save it. Camp number two is let's not even yeah. look at it. Let's not look at it sideways, you know. And what I'm most proud of is I think we have invented camp number three. And camp number three is a non-invasive biological health assessment. Clearly, people have been observing animals from cliffs and whatever, but you need that biological data to know what's going on. And what's cool is almost every data set we collect links back to that. And you got to love this. So I'm working with a group in Gloucester now called the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute. Okay. And they're looking at the microbiomes and they're saying, we think we're going to be able to tell you if the whale is healthy or unhealthy from the microbiome. And mm -hmm. often, and again, maybe this is, I'm, I'm simpling it down, but a poor analogy. Often they ask you to pee in a cup at a doctor because if you're sick, some of these microbiomes will go a little bit rampant. Do you know what I mean? Because they're filling a void that's left open because you're sick at some level. And, you know, we have more microbiome cells in our body 
than our own cells because we've got them in our hair, in our skin, in our lungs, in our gut. I mean, probiotics is a huge industry. So just the microbiomes, they're saying, we think we can do a health assessment, okay? From the genetics, it's really important to know, are you male? Are you female? Are you related to that animal? And then almost back to where we started with the sperm whales, are there population bottlenecks here, you know, where there's a lack of diversity within the population here genetically, which is going to cause a problem? Do you know what I mean? A robust group of whales will have quite a diverse um, gene pool, as it were. So the genetics can tell us a lot about the short term, you know what I mean? Who's mating with who, who's related, just how diverse that group of animals is, which is important. Is that just one family or is it a diverse group? Just the, the group I'm studying. But it can also speak to the, 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 the um, population genetics that, that we're concerned about. And in fact, I think off Africa, we discovered a new female genetic line or haplotype which is in the case of this population of whales, the haplotype is passed through the population. So to discover a new sort of genetic line from an exhalation is pretty cool. Uh, one thing that I'm a little bit curious about is, I, I should say that is pretty cool, but one thing I'm, I'm uh, quite curious about is, you know, uh, the Japanese whalers were saying they were, they were doing whale calls for scientific purposes. That they would they would be doing some I don't know what they were trying to find out but they they said that they were shooting them to right. do some science. The question I have is: Is there anything that you can't do with snotbot? So, for example, um, you know maybe you need to cull an animal to look at its stomach contents or something along these lines. Is 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 there is is there any validity to their claim that you know they need to cull animals to do science? So uh, does, do these new techniques like the biopsy gun right. and then flying over with the are they able to account for? You know, can, yeah. can you can you do everything with? Right. Well, two two things here. The first thing is go online and look for the number of publications based on thirty or fifty years of commercial whaling, and I can't remember. There's like ten. You know, mm -hmm. when you look to people like me and it's like publish or perish, you know, you do two or three papers a year. So I can't remember, but an international court just recently actually told the Japanese they could no longer whale under the premise of scientific whaling because they're not publishing any papers. So mm -hmm. that's point number one. Point number two, no, you don't need to kill whales anymore to learn about them. The, the good news is now, as you know, maybe even more exciting than Snotbot, although I'm not, I won't repeat that again, is it's the whole suite of tools that are, that are now available to us. For example, some of these um, tags they're putting on the animals that last for months, do you know what I mean? And some of the short-term tags that have accelerometers and can listen to the heartbeat and the heart rate of the animals. So I actually think there's absolutely no reason anymore to kill a whale, no validity at all. Truth be said, whales do die. And when they do die, you know, the scientists will do necropsies. But I actually think, I think there's now even cameras that, you know, we can swallow that go through our intestinal system. And probably within two or three years, who knows, a drone will be dropping something in front of a whale that it might eat. And we'll actually look at the intestinal tract of a whale with some new piece of equipment. I mean, you know, I love the fact that Apple is putting so much money into us monitoring ourselves because the cheaper and more affordable these tools are, the better they are for people like me because maybe now I can have almost disposable tools that I can afford to stick on a whale and if I don't get it back, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? As against, you know, a lot of, I was working with a gentleman called Bruce Mate and some of the early um, satellite tags were more than $10,000 a tag and then the airtime was costing like another five thousand dollars over six months so it's like 15 grand for one tag you know what i mean mm. but that that is now rapidly changing mm. and i want to do one thing too because we missed one thing going back a step on the data the most exciting data that we're getting here now gotta remember i i'm i'm like the judge here i'm not the judge but i'm like the 
the person that's sort of corralling all the scientists here. But I love it when I talk to the DNA person. Ian, DNA is the most important. I talk to the microbiome. Ian, microbiomes is most important. The, the most interesting one to me, actually, that's not fair. But the, the one that is unresolved right now are the hormones. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, and I'm sorry I should be able to reel them all off, but right now we're already getting half a dozen hormones in the exhalations, okay, that, that are saying, well, you know, to have that hormone, it's got to be female. To have that hormone, it's got to be pregnant. To have this hormone, whatever. But the one that I'm most interested in, and I think biologists are probably most interested in, are stress hormones. Because mm -hmm. if you can actually say, you know, seismic exploration stresses whales, then you, will ha then you can talk to the people that do seismic exploration and say, okay, this is their breeding time of the year in this location, no seismic exploration. And I believe there are statements out there which are almost sad, but where these people are saying, hey, you don't have any proof showing mm -hmm. that this is affecting whales. Now, that's okay, but I'm also a great believer of the precautionary principle. If I'm driving my car and the steering wheel's going like this, I'm not going to be like, it's fine, honey, don't worry. You know what I mean? I'm going to be like, yeah. let's stop the car and check. I think there is enough blood in the water to suggest a lot of these activities aren't good for whales, but this is a world we live in. Show me the proof. And I, and I think, I think for me, what's so exciting is, you know, I weigh 155 pounds. How, you know, some of these whales are weighing over 100 tons. What stresses an animal that weighs over 100 tons, you know? Hmm. And if they have these giant acoustic computers, maybe some of these noises don't stress them. But maybe, you know, a, a, a giant squid farting does stress them. I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you know what I mean? Hmm. I think it's a yeah. wonderful question to finally see what stresses these animals. The problem with stress hormones, and I hope I'm using the correct verbiage here, is Stress is not a qualitative metric, it's a quantitative. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we take 10 cc of blood right now, we know for 10 cc, this is a normal level, this is a stress level. What we don't know with whales is, you know, exactly how much of the stress hormones are going into the blow. We don't know how much of the stress hormone in the blow we're collecting. Do you know what I mean? So it, it's mm -hmm. a tough one. So I guess it's also di diluted with water as well. Exactly. It's got exactly. And by mm -hmm. the way, we, we, have, we distinguish re between two types of blows, one we call a wet blow and a dry blow. And what's interesting, we think certain wet blows are better for carrying the biological stuff to our dish, when dry blows are probably better for things like hormones. Now, That's the, the whale breathing outside the water and then just below the water? That's the yeah, difference? Yeah, exactly. Or? or if it's a rough day or there's a crosswind or if the wave breaks just as it's blowing. You know what I mean? So one's contaminated, one's not contaminated with yeah. the seawater. Yeah. Well, they all tend to have some, but but yeah, but but you know, but anyway, but it's a it's a I mean again, it's a it's a wonderful Indiana Jones, Nancy Drew sort of mystery which which I, I sort of love, you know. And I and I would say to be clear to hopefully any kids that are listening, you know, biology is just like, I remember in England, in England, there used to be this TV show and they would put up pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and the winner of the show was the person who could guess what that jigsaw puzzle was a picture of. Did that make sense? Yeah. So who could guess with the fewest number of mm -hmm. pieces what the image is? That's what's whale biology or any biology, we're looking for enough pieces of the jigsaw so we can understand what the problem is or what the answer is or what the solution is. You know, how cool is that? And what's cool about the drones, you know, we've talked about snot and we've said, you know, microbiomes, uh, DNA, hormones, you know, metabolomics, whatever, but we've also got photogrammetry. 
We're measuring whales. We're using the camera and the fixed focal. We've got photogrammetry. We're using thermal cameras to try to measure body temperature. We're talking about other sensors like hyperspectral cameras. We're looking at scars. We're looking at inflammation. I mean, and this is all from a drone that's costing a couple of grand. So it's just crazy how much data we're getting from this sort of affordable tool. And that really excites me. <coughs> And, and my staff have heard this 99 million times. Oceanography, because of its very nature, has tended to be a prerogative of the privilege. You need big boats. You need expensive equipment. You need all this type of stuff to go out there and spend a lot of time out there. And if you think about if you're studying a giraffe on the Serengeti, it doesn't throw a bucket of salt water at you in your Land Rover disappear beneath the Serengeti and reappear five miles away, as whales tend to do. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. this type of research is just difficult and expensive. And I'm really excited because drones like Snotbot, and we should talk about the name later too, are democratizing science. Mm -hmm. You know, And we've been all over the world, from Africa to Argentina to Mexico, and everywhere we go, we leave them a drone. And you know what? Mm -hmm. what? In Africa, they used a drone to look at illegal globe mining, gold mm -hmm. mining. In the Dominican Republic, they used one of our drones to try to check on manatees. I think this is bloody fantastic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What a time to be living in with these new affordable technologies and what a time to be caring about the wild world. Hmm. I have to ask you about some of the other results you're able to get uh, with these sort of less invasive or non-invasive techniques. So, so you mentioned earlier on about the Deepwater Horizon um, accident, the, yeah. this Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Um, <laughs> what was the outcome there for whales? So, so do, do whales now avoid that, the, the, that part of the ocean? Uh, are, are you seeing um, high levels of, of toxic compounds in, in whale mucus that are in those areas? What, what, What's the outcome there? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little, uh, you may notice, I'm a little bitter about my time in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. In part, I believe because, um, you know, BP spent many millions of dollars telling people that um, the Gulf is fine, you know, and it's amazing. We live in a society where if people say it enough, people start believing it. And mm. I'd say this to you. Imagine I had three dozen eggs, all right? And I said to you, I am going to disperse these eggs all over your house. By the way, rotten eggs. Would you rather I disperse these eggs all over your house, under the bed, in the wardrobes or whatever? Or would you rather, you know, I just put all the eggs in the bathtub? And mm. I do feel we had a lot of evidence to suggest that the act of using the dispersant was worse than the spill itself. Okay. Uh, so, so what did they, I, I'm actually not familiar. What did they do there? They, so they added some chemical that broke down the oil. Uh, what, how, how, how did the uh, dispersants work? Yeah, exactly. So they used an undisclosed amount, although in the many, I think hundreds of millions of gallons of dispersant that was pumped out at depth with the oil release. So it mixed with the oil, and the idea then is a lot of the oil never even reached the surface. But again, mm -hmm. guess what? It's dispersed through the water column, and that mm -hmm. means it will spend more time in the water column than it would have just at the surface or just at the bottom. So then it then just dilutes throughout the world's oceans. Is, is that the idea? Well, that, and then on top of that, you have this other dispersant, which is that toxic? What's Well, exactly. So... Um, we actually tried to get samples of the dispersant, and I think my business partner in this, Dr. John Wise, who's at the University of Louisville, John and his team were aboard our boat, and they were actually growing cell lines. So we would biopsy the animal, and you probably heard this, but if you take living tissue, keep it warm, sterile, and fed, it will just keep growing. So John mm -hmm. grew cell lines, and then he exposed these living cells to different concentrations of different toxicants over different timelines. Does that make this sense? This is whale cells. Uh, correct. So, so you shoot them with one of your 
biopsy guns, yeah. you collect the cells Take and then you grow tissue, heaps of them. Put yeah. it in an agar yeah. plate, put it in a sterile hood, grow it, and then you put them in all these plates and you expose it to different concentrations of different toxicants. And to be blunt, and I'll make it very short, but what John found is that the least toxic was this, I think it's a, you know, a detergent called Dawn or something like that, was, was not very toxic. The next least toxic was oil, okay? Mm -hmm. Or the next, maybe if you want to go more toxic, the next more toxic was a dispersant called Corexic, okay? And actually the most toxic was Corexic mixed with oil. Because if you think about it, if you have a little bit of oil on your hand here, you know, that's fine. If you add a, a sulfactant to it, like it's, you know, dispersant, suddenly it it again becomes more bioavailable. It's now all over your hand. So whether you the increase the surface area exactly. of the uh, right, and okay. you're dispersing it out. And now squid that wouldn't be getting it, or fish, or or whatever. So, you know. So the 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 better approach would have been the expensive approach, I suppose, which would have been to let it go to the surface and then skim it off the top. Skim it, or um, burn it, or collect it, or or however, or even let it go on the shoreline. So yeah. why, how, why were they allowed to? You know, are there are there regulations for what you're allowed to pump into the ocean? Am I allowed well, to? There pump? are regulations yeah. for what you and I are allowed to do. I mean, so I, you know, I can easily sort of be attacked on the storyline I'm giving you. In this one particular area, I'm just more ed more educated than most. It doesn't mean that I'm not necessarily wrong. I can just tell you from the sort of the peripheral data what happened, which was very successful, was once again out of sight, out of mind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can even tell you this, and I'm trying to remember, and I'm sorry here, but I think it was 60 minutes. And I think 60 minutes were going to join us on Sunday on our research vessel. And on Thursday, they capped the oil, they capped it successfully. And they called me on Friday and said, you know, we're not coming because they've capped the well. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This biological story is just starting. And let me tell you something. From the Exxon Valdez oil spill 27 years later, I can't even remember, 28 years later, there are still biological effects there. There's a group of orcas up there, a population that are functionally extinct, you know, they're digging down and they're finding crabs aren't digging down deeper than like 18 inches because there's this like layer of oil down there. So they are still having effects 27 years later, 28 years later. And here we are, well, I was, you know, one week after they capped the spill and basically, hey, it's okay, it's done, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, um, I, listen, I'm disappointed, and maybe the failure was mine because I'm a bad fundraiser, fundraiser, or a bad storyteller. But when you look at the 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 Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the smallest part of the story were the animals that were living right there, right next to the next to the um, next to the next to the spill. And in fact, um, John Wise and I were invited to give a um, a series of talks at the um, American, Adva American Academy for the Advancement of Science at AAAS conference, which is about one of the most pre prestigious conferences in, in North America. So John, um, I gave an introductory talk. John talked about whale cells. Samantha Joy, I think, talked about sediments. And we had a gentleman talk about fish and somebody else talk about shrimp. So we have a five-speaker session. There was then a session on the Gulf of Mexico Symposium, which is a much smaller conference than AAAS. And I propose that we give this AAAS conference at the Gulf Symposium, and we were turned down. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't know. And again, hey, maybe it's my fault, but there just didn't seem to be an interest in Wales or what's going on offshore or toxicology. So can I ask, so, so it was John Wise, you said, yes. uh, was culturing these um, yeah. cell cultures and growing these cell cultures. And he was exposing them to um, dispersants and oils and, and finding that 
that combination was highly toxic as right. in it killed lots of the cells have have we actually seen in in wales then um you know have there been deaths reported or or are the whales becoming infertile or what in terms of actual outcomes for the populations in the gulf what what are you able to see well guess what and you just nailed it what are you able to see do you know what happens to whales when they die they go down they sink there you go out of sight but you can you can count right like the are you seeing less um less whales in the air what what yeah. What about on that level? Well, again, can you count? I mean, how many surveys are done there counting whales every year? Very few. I mean, you know, this is, you know, we would have to go 45 miles offshore to get into the deep water, you know, to start the work. This is just not cheap work to do. And no, I've done a few cruises. I mean, to answer your one question, though, and I would suggest any listeners go and look this up, after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, what did happen is thousands of dolphins died, okay? And mm-hmm. it looks like they died because of a, a virus they typically carry with them, and actually, typically, they're quite immune to. But you want me to just try to put A and B together? You know, their immune systems were impaired by the exposure to the oil and, and the corexit, and because of that, you know, it's like, what do you call it, that, you know, the, the, the what do you call it, the stick that broke the camel's back, mm-hmm. that one other mm-hmm. thing that was just too much. It's comorbidities, exactly. essentially, the same, same thing that happens with COVID. Right. So that, Thank you, yeah, exactly. So, so um, okay, well, how, how is it that we know that thousands of dolphins die, but for the larger whales... What's the difference there? How, how, how are we able to get those numbers? Well, actually, because in most of those cases, um, the dolphins were in shallow water. Do you know what I mean? And they either beached themselves or were found floating or they weren't in water that was one or two miles deep, you know? Mm-hmm. Can I, mean, I, I ask... Think, um, or, or, you know, from my end... I, sorry, I just want to be very clear here. Um, and I think we've been successful with this. And I think that the... Um, the funds from BP that have gone into the Gulf Symposium. You know, we know more now about the Gulf of Mexico than ever before, which is just fantastic. And I think we do know enough now to say, for example, um, I mean, I don't know, this is back to legislation again. The use of the dispersants is not necessarily a good idea in all situations. Do you know what I mean? I guess the Mm -hmm. sad thing about it, though, it was incredibly successful as an out of sight, out of mind tactic, though. Mm. You know. So it's going to happen again. The so in terms of good news stories, then I guess can you detect things like so when you're using snotboard and these biopsy um, guns, can, can you detect things like DDT? I mean that there's been a moratorium on on those chemicals. Are you seeing a reduction in in, in chemicals like DDT? Are you able to det- detect things like that? So that's what we did with the biopsy work. And actually, that was um, quite disappointing when we went around the world. Um, you know, there are so many exotic chemicals now that we make to be resistant to nature, from fire retardants to, you know, I, I mean, I've so many long and complicated names, we, we can both fall asleep here. And the reality is, you know, a lot of them are in plastic, and we know what's happening to all the plastics in the ocean. So ocean pollution is not a good thing right now. You know, it, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's not a good story. The one weakness I would say, going back to Snotbot, although Dr. Wise has samples in right now, is I don't think we get enough of a sample in a blow to look for these exotic chemicals. Mm-hmm. So um, I think we might have things like metals, like chromium and, and lead and mercury, because if we find any of these metals in the blow, Metals don't float in the water, they sink. So if there are any in the blow, then it has to come from um, slough skin, you know, from cells in their lungs that are then caught um, in the drones. But I think, you know, going back a step, we have more capacity to have more people out there collecting more data 
more consistently because of these drones. So while the problems are increasing, you know, we now have a government that appreciates science, understands science, is concerned about what scientific data is telling us. So I think we're on the right track. And I want to encourage, you know, young listeners to sort of get involved in what is the, the greatest adventure of our time, which is the mysteries of planet ocean, healthy oceans, healthy whales, healthy humans. Speaking about the mysteries of planet ocean, uh, so you've been out on the open water uh, a lot. Correct. For, um, have, have you, and speaking about the plastics, have you seen uh, these huge plastic um, uh, Giant, co- collections? Yeah, in, uh, yeah I think, I think um, this has been slightly oversold and slightly mm-hmm. undersold, if that makes sense. When you go to these locations, you don't see giant islands of Pacific, of, of, of garbage. I mean, the size of Texas. But mm-hmm. if you do... It's dispersed. Yeah. But you don't even, you know, you'd be surprised how little actual plastic you see. But when you drag, and we have one of these, a manta trawl through the water. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this. If you, if you ever picked up a, an old bottle on, a, on, on the beach and like crushed it and it's broken. That's because Mm -hmm. the plasticizers have leached out. So this Mm -hmm. is what happened. The plasticizers have leached out. And these little bits of plastic, the tiny ones, actually a lot of these little fish, I'll have to look, I'll just write this down, wait a minute. Um, There's an incredible video out there of plankton eating little bits of plastic. Because they, they, they did it under a light where they got the plankton where they got the plastic to fluoresce, and you actually see the plankton eating these little bits of plastic because they think it's food. So can they break it down or they cannot break it down. And actually, mm-hmm. what's of concern for, for, for marine mammals, and we're just starting this project now, is these plastics do have a bunch of these man-made chemicals in them. And I'm worried that when they get ingested by whales and they get warmed up inside the, the animal's body, that more of these chemicals might leach out. So we are now actually collecting whale feces as well as whale snot to look at the levels of microplastic in whale feces. But, Glamorous I mean, science. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's actually a little bit scary because, you know, whales are perfect plastic collectors. You know what I mean? They're skimming the ocean, you know, for mm-hmm. whatever's floating there. So guess what? Let's add another notch on the whale, you know, the whale obstacle course they have to, to go through to survive. Before asking you about the an overview for how you see uh in, before asking you about how dire the situation is for whales, I want to ask, since you're out on the ocean um, as part of your job, when you're out in the deep oceans, way away from shore, is it like a desert or, or are there sort of amazing things you've been able to see, amazing life that, um, what are the remarkable things you've been able to see uh, out at sea yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you, when you're in the deep? Well, actually, so first of all, you know, being a hundred miles from shore, you live a life of nature. Do you know what I mean? Your day is ruled by sunrise and sunset, by clouds, by storms, by weather. You actually become very connected with the wild world. And I will admit, I used to be at sea for like three months at a time, and I'd come back and sit in a shopping mall and just look around and go, man, you know, what is what what has happened to us? And alas. I think we have become very disconnected from nature, you know, because so many of us don't have that opportunity to sort of rewild ourselves, if you like, to sort of get out there and be reconnected with the wild world. So it's an amazing experience. I will say in the last, in 2017 and 18, um, I was on our research vessel and for the first time ever, we had 24-hour-a-day internet on board the boat. Now, it was wonderful because the crew were texting friends and family, but I actually felt something had been lost there because, you know, in 2000 and... um, What would it be? 2089, 2090, you know? uh, I'm sorry, sorry. In 
1990, when I was in the Galapagos on this boat with a single sideband radio, we did have basic sat nav at that time, but you were offshore. You weren't exactly sure where you were. You know, you it was uh, there's something very raw and exciting about about that type of work and technology. While I'm a believer in technology, I do feel if we're not careful, it, it's taking taking things away from us. You know, we go from our air conditioned office to our air conditioned car to our air conditioned home. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We're very sort of disconnected from the real world. And I think, you know, we need to reconnect people, although I think it is happening. I think there is a, you know, more eco adventures and what, whatever it takes, you know, to, to get people back to the wild world. Certainly, what's interesting, just so you know, when we went around the world with the Odyssey working with sperm whales, the females and calves tend to work on the equatorial zone. What happens at the equator, because the planet is spinning, you've got this Coriolis effect. What happens, winds are blowing to the poles, and they're taking the surface of the ocean with them towards the poles, okay? And guess what? That water has to be replaced. You get what's called an equatorial upwelling, where the deep waters come into the surface. Now, remember, nearly everything on, on, that, hit, that sits on the surface of the ocean, when it dies, it sinks to the bottom. So the most productive areas on our oceans tend to be the surface where you've got the whole mad sort of food chain going on that's led by sunlight and, and you know, um, chlorophyll and, and whale poop and feces. You've got this stuff going on the surface. And then because everything dies, you've got what they call this marine snow. And then you've got this very productive thing at the bottom. But then along the equator, and along the edges of certain islands, you get these what are called equatorial upwellings where all the food is brought to the surface. And the Galapagos are one of these great examples where you've got penguins and flamingos on the same island. Because on the surface, it's hot, but you've got these equatorial upwellings. And I found, you know, sperm whales with, with marks on their bodies the size of like a plate, which are coming from... Arcatuthus or this giant squid, which are their prey, and you know, you can't go. So you've seen that yourself. You've I, seen these markings. I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, our oceans, you know, are are just one of the most fascinating ecosystems on our planet. You know, I mean, on one level, you heard they say we know more about outer space than inner space. To me, that's like great. That means there are enormous opportunities for adventure and exploration. And we've done a little work with this group called Ocean X that have this big boat called the Ocean Explorer. And I think on their last trip, they discovered like 80 new species. I mean, how, you know, you can't go on shore and discover 80 new species. Of, I mean, of, of what, fish or well, mammals? I think there were or... fish and plankton and, you know, all sorts. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's, still, it's still a great time to be a sort of ocean barnstormer ocean discoverer what about yourself have you ever discovered something uh new well actually we did we were in the um indian ocean and um we photographed an animal that discovered out had never been seen before it it um oh my gosh i'm trying to remember the name of the species now um oh boy i'm in trouble my i'm going to be in big trouble here but um it was a species of of um, beaked whale that had only actually been seen by its skull. So they'd found skulls of this animal, but they'd never seen a live one. So we, we were actually the first to document a live version of this particular animal. And by the way, some friends of ours just recently discovered a new species of beaked whale off Mexico. Hmm. You know, it's still happening there. It's just, you know, a friend of mine, a uh, 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 Flip Nicklin, who was a cinematographer, he felt that to get good imagery, you just needed F8 and be there. So F8 is the camera setting. He's like, F8 yeah. and be there, Ian. So I think yeah. good good photography and good science is the same. F8 and be there. You're just going to be time on the water. But these drones now will give us the opportunity to spend time on the water. One of my fantasies is to have a one of these autonomous boats mm-hmm. with a 
drone garage on the autonomous boat. So the autonomous boat is driving and listening and hearing something, and then we can open up the lab and the drone can go up, even if it's on a tether. A tethered drone just goes up and can hover up there and see what's going on and go down again, you know? I think, uh, yeah. anyway, I'm-, I'm I, guess, I guess on land you have trail cameras, so this exactly. would be the equivalent. Exactly. But what about in terms of uh, whale behavior? Is there anything in the 30 years you've been on the ocean, is there anything in particular that you saw it for the first time and it was just, what the hell is going on there? Um, but I would actually say, in the last five years, I've seen more unique behaviors than I've ever seen before. Think about this. I would say to you, if you said, I want to go out and study a species of animal that lives underwater most of the time, I would say the worst way to do that would be sitting on a small boat. And that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Getting up in the air now, we're seeing how they're using their pectoral fins to sort of corral prey. We're seeing how they're flashing their pectoral fins to sort of scare fish. We're seeing how they coordinate under, underwater movements. I mean, getting up in the air and looking down at these animals is the only way to, only way to really have glimpses into their lives that we've just never had before. Hmm. And so I, I think um, I've just realized we've been talking now for two hours, oh, wow. so we, okay. <laughs> we, should pro- we should probably wrap up. But um, I, I wanted to ask, you know, we started off in the discussion um, talking about what, the, what things look like uh, for whales when you first started uh, in your career. And so how have things changed over the past 30 years? Where are we now? You know, have things improved? I, I guess we're talking a lot about a lot of species here, but so, so what is the status now and where are we headed? I mean, I think our, clearly there's so many great scientists out there and concerned individuals. We know more about these whales than we've ever known before. And they have incredible diverse lifestyles. It looks like they have culture in their language. I mean, It's just incredible what we know about these animals, and it's exciting. But, Hmm. I said this before, the oceans are downhill from everything, and we are a species out of sight, out of mind. I mean, we live in a world of sight, they live in a world of sound. It's hard for us to even imagine. And the problem is, you know, they are just under enormous human threats, you know, and we just need people to get engaged. We just need people to care. We just need people to think beyond their own daily lifestyle. And I think we're getting it. I think we're slowly, you know, I think we're becoming wiser as a species. I don't think we're becoming smarter. And I think, you know, I did not grow up with the idea of wildlife conservation. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't believe that humanity as a species could change the climate of our planet, you know, you would have said, what? That is just crazy. And clearly, you know, there's more than enough evidence to suggest, yes, we are changing our climate. What it means, we don't really know. But I think that, I think just a one word of encouragement I'd like to say to your listeners, I'd like to beg to your listeners, is just do something. You know, just do something. Mm-hmm. You know, this death of a million cuts could be death of a thousand cuts, then death of a hundred cuts. You know, when I talk to kids, I say to kids, hey, you kids like honey? I like honey. Where do you see honey? I see all the jars of honey up on the shelf in the stores. But where does honey come from? Honey comes from millions of trips for millions of bees carrying a package so small you can't see it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? People have got to understand the value of just doing something. If everybody just did something, just a little bit, once a week, once a month, you know, once a day, we could change the world for the better. And it really, it's going to affect our children and our grandchildren. Because I'm sure you've heard this, on the 100-year test, what happens in Congress today, tomorrow, next month, Republican, Democratic, they won't even be able to measure it. But what we do to preserve our environment will make a difference. And the tragedy for me right now is the deniers. We know there's enough evidence out there to suggest we're messing up, you know, we're messing up our own bed. 
Do you know what I mean? And we need to clean up our act here for the benefit of ourselves and our grandchildren and clearly for the species that are really important on this planet, the, the species that are running Spaceship Earth.